Welcome, Maryland viewers. My name is Cheryl Maddox. I'm a retired journalist who worked at the Cecil Whig newspaper in Elkton for nearly 32 years. I will be your moderator today. This debate was, has been organized by Cecil Public Media as part of its mission to provide fair and accurate information to Cecil County. I would first like to thank Dr. Mary Way Bolt, president of Cecil College, and the staff of Milburn Stone Theater for hosting this debate and helping us with its production. The questions in this debate will cover six topics of national and local importance, including the economy, immigration, abortion, military power, election integrity, and personal legislative priorities. I'd now like to introduce the two candidates for Maryland's first congressional district. Incumbent Republican Andy Harris, seeking his seventh term, and Democrat challenger Heather Nazir. Thank you all for being here today. Now for a few ground rules. The candidates have drawn numbers to determine the order in which they will provide opening statements, answer questions, and offer closing statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds for opening statements, 60 seconds for closing statements. The first five questions will be directed to all candidates. Each will have 90 seconds to answer. After all candidates have answered, each will get 60 seconds to respond. A sixth and final question will be specific to each individual candidate. They will have 90 seconds to answer and the other candidates will have 60 seconds for rebuttal. Cecil TV's time cap Keeper will flash a brightly colored card when a candidate has 15 seconds left for their answer. And once the candidate's time is up, the timekeeper will ring a bell. And with that behind us, let's get started. <clears throat> As determined by the drawing, the first opening statement will be from Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank Cecil Public Media. I want to, Cheryl, good to see you again. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank uh, Cecil Public Media for one decision they made, which is actually to invite all the candidates. Now, obviously, not all of them showed up, but the right thing to do is actually invite everyone, because in a democracy, no, no voices should be silenced, all voices should be heard, so I applaud them for that. Look, I think this is the greatest country in the world, there's no question about it but a vast majority of American people believe that this country is on the wrong track. That the Biden-Pelosi agenda has led us down that wrong track for the last two years. <clears throat> I hope today we're going to talk about a lot of the uh, issues people talk about in their, in their living rooms and around the kitchen table. The unbelievably high cost of living uh, that has popped up in the last year and a half, whether it's gas or groceries or all the other things that uh, we have to pay for. <laughs> it's, it's the safety in your home and your communities. It's uh, watching the murder rate in Baltimore City. It's watching state's attorneys around the country or district attorneys around the country failing to prosecute crime. It's listening to the Democrats talking about defunding the police and the importance of doing that. The open southern border allowing tons of fentanyl to cross our southern border and kill 70,000 Americans last year. This is something that Americans just don't uh, want to tolerate. And finally, the stripping of parental rights, whether that's school curriculum, the woke transgender uh, agenda in schools, keeping secrets from parents. We've got to go down a different track. I hope we discuss these issues today. Um, Ms. Mazir, your opening statement. As I campaign across this beautiful district, I regularly meet with voters who are struggling to pay the bills and who think no one in government cares about them. We need a representative who shows up, listens, <clears throat> works hard, and reaches across the aisle for bipartisan solutions. As Johnny Shockley, a third generation waterman who appeared in my first TV ad said, I don't care about political parties, I care about the people. I'm a bipartisan consensus builder. And in the 12 years that Andy Harris has been our congressman, we've seen who he is. He is ranked as one of the most divisive members of Congress in the entire country, and he's ineffective. He's taken nearly $2 million in taxpayer-funded salary, and he's passed one law to rename a post office. Now, he can't defend his record, so today you're going to hear him bring up people and issues that have nothing to do with this race. He's going to name-check Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden to distract from the fact 
that the names on your ballot are Andy Harris and Heather Mazier, and the choices could not be more clear. We need leadership that brings us together again. Our greatest national security threat is our polarization, and Andy Harris is part of the problem. I'm building a unity coalition of common sense, good-hearted people that want to come together again to solve problems and get good things done. I hope to have the honor to earn your support today. Thank you both for your opening statements. Now we'll move on to our questions. The first question concerns the U.S. economy, and we'll go to Mr. Harris. Inflation is the top concern of voters, according to most polls. The outcome of races across the country and the control of Congress may well turn on voters' experience with prices at the gas pump and in the grocery store. What steps can you take to stem inflation and support our economy? Thank you. Uh, look, clearly this is the top issue on people's minds. Every time they drive past a gas station, they're reminded of it. Every time a farmer wants to fill their tractors with <coughs> diesel, they're reminded of it. Record high prices in, uh, in both cases. Uh, now better, better than they were a few months ago, but 150% higher than they were two years ago. The cost in the grocery store, I like to tell people, I like to do the grocery shopping in my family. I go to the grocery store, it's not 8.3% inflation. It's 20, 30, 40% inflation on the things that you're buying every day. That's the, those are the facts. And they were brought about in large part by two of the uh, Biden administration policies. One is reckless spending. They pumped trillions of dollars into the economy, literally inventing money that chased a limited amount of supplies, resulting in runaway inflation. The other one is their <clears throat> headlong effort to end fossil fuel use and production in this country. A very foolish thing, looking around the world at, at what happened in, in the, in the, with Russia and Ukraine, not to take advantage of our geopolitical situation is just wrong. So what, what would my opponent do? I don't know, you can look at her record. She voted for 40 tax increases in the O'Malley administration. She voted for every one of his reckless spending budgets. And she voted to limit fossil fuels. The bottom line is that that is a road to disaster for, the, for our economy. We have to take a different road. Yeah, yeah, you know, I have a reputation of being a fighter in Washington. I fight for the people in the first district. Not always popular. Okay, Ms. Mazir. The economy is the most important issue in this campaign. I spent the first year of this race uh, having detailed conversations and coming up with a 34-page strategy called uh, Economy First. Now, it's gonna be hard to summarize a 34 plan in 90 seconds, but here goes on the top lines. We need to make more in America. We have to have more manufacturing and construction jobs right here in our district, like clean nanobiotechnology right here in Elkton that has a 75,000 square foot new facility creating 500 jobs in the life sciences in our state. I have ideas on how we can build on jobs like that. Yes, we have to rein in inflation, and we do that by cracking down on corporate price gouging and keeping federal spending in check. We need to fix our broken supply chains to help small businesses and to lower costs. And I champion economic strategies that are for Main Street, not Wall Street. But it's also a hyper-local plan, looking at the job needs specific to the first congressional district, agriculture and forestry, commercial fishing and aquaculture, defense and cybersecurity, housing that working families can afford, and addressing our infrastructure needs where we put people to work while simultaneously improving our broadband, building up our ports, our rail, our bridges, rebuilding our failing water systems that are polluting our bay and the Conowingo Dam's need for more dredging all around this district. I hope that you'll have a chance to read the plan at heathermazier.com. Thank you, okay. Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds for a rebuttal, if you choose. Thank you very much. You don't need a 34-page plan. The bottom line is this is pretty obvious. What you have to do is drill for American oil and natural gas, take over world supremacy in that geopolitical market, and drive the Russians out of business. Doesn't need a 34-page plan. You don't need a 34-page plan to, to figure out that the federal government is spending too much money. The federal government is, is $31 trillion in debt. And by her record, my opponent, by her record in Annapolis, she will contribute to that, not alleviate that. This isn't rocket science. You don't need 34 pages. 
Well, Congressman, that 34-page plan is not mine. It's the people of the 1st Congressional District who I spend time talking to. You're pretty much in hiding. You're not in the community meeting with people to hear what they're looking for, what their dreams and aspirations are. And let's talk about energy independence for a minute. You can measure that by the fact that we are already exporting more than we import. We're also producing more than we consume. There are 9,100 unused permits on drill for drilling on federal lands right now. What's the problem? Price gouging. Your corporate friends are spending more time on making sure that they prioritize shareholders rather than the consumers at the pump. The barrel of oil isn't any more expensive right now than it used to be. But why is gas so much higher? Because capital discipline today for oil companies is about no production gains. There's price gouging going on. You're protecting your corporate friends who fund your campaign. You voted against a bill to keep price gouging in check. You're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, our second question <clears throat> concerns the topic of immigration. And the first to answer will be Mr. Harris. Comprehensive immigration reform is an elusive goal, yet the number of people who wish to come to our country for economic reasons or as asylum seekers remains unabated. As a House member, would you work toward re immigration reform? And what do you think reform should look like? Look, it's a great question, very serious question. As a son of immigrants, I fully understand that legal immigration is important to this nation. Fully understand it. Immigrants have contributed, but they've also come here legally, mostly, until last year. When the Biden administration decided to throw open, throw wide open our southern border, 2.4 million apprehensions 600,000 getaways means 3 million people decided that they were not going to follow American law and cross the border. And what was their punishment? Oh, no, no, they weren't punished. They were rewarded. They were rewarded with the promise of potential asylum and admitted into the country temporarily, maybe permanently. I'm not sure who's going to ask them to leave. But that's not the worst thing about an open southern border. The worst thing about an open southern border is the flow of fentanyl. Now, Cecil County has done an admirable job in controlling drug abuse and dealing with it. It was one of the early ones, earliest ones in the district. I remember visiting up here with the coalitions that did it. You can't win this war if you, if you don't control the flow of fentanyl across our southern border. It killed 70,000 Americans last year. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to get worse before it gets better unless you completely close the border and allow no one without a visa to cross that border. You turn them back. I'm sorry, we have to protect 70,000 American lives every year before we tr protect the single, a single illegal person crossing our southern border. I think we're supposed to avoid clapping. Thank you. Y'all don't know how to follow the rules. Um, okay. Your response, Heather? <laughs> Immigration, our immigration system is, is absolutely broken. We're a nation of immigrants, and our country benefits from enhanced culture and an enhanced economy from the contribution of immigrants. But we need comprehensive reform that is tough, fair, practical, and leads to a pathway to citizenship. And that must include borders that are strong, smart, and secure. We can be true to our values and treat people with dignity and respect while maintaining our national security interests. We need more border agents. We need funding for their training. And we need to give them better technology to address protection at the border as well as the flow of fentanyl. We don't need cruel policies that separate families or foolish ones that spend billions of dollars on a wall that just won't work. Polarization is the entire reason why this is still an issue. Good people can come together to find these tough, smart, practical solutions to solve the problem we all agree exists in this district. But we have a congressman that wants to use this issue as a partisan wedge. All you heard were talking points to divide us up. There were no solutions in that. If you send me to Washington, I'll work with other good-hearted people that want to actually fix this problem for us 
and not use it as a political football. Thank you. Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds for a rebuttal. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I, I thought you all heard what my solution was. You close the southern border. You enforce immigration law. This country is a rule, is a country of the rule of law. Congress makes the laws. The administration is supposed to enforce them. Congress may, there are immigration laws on the books. My opponent speaks though there are no immigration laws on the books. There are lots of immigration laws on the books. This, this government, this administration chooses not to enforce them. So what's the result? Three million illegals crossed last year. We are obligated to teach those children in our public schools diluting the education of our children because you have to spend more money, you have to have bilingual teachers, you have to overcome, overcome the disadvantages these children had where they came from. A pathway to citizenship? No, I don't want to reward anyone who crosses our border illegally with a pathway to citizenship. And talk about treating with respect, what respect is it for this country to break our law by crossing our border? Ms. Mazir, 60 seconds for your rebuttal. I just am hearing more of the same, more division, more throwing around, desire to make us scared of each other, instead of acknowledging that we all want the same thing. We're a country of laws. We need a secure border. We're a country of immigrants. We welcome those who come who want to follow our rules. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say that immigration laws aren't being enforced, but then yourself say that there were 2.6 million people apprehended. That sounds to me like a policy that is being absolutely enforced. Is it perfect? No. <laughs> when is it ever? I don't know any administration that hasn't struggled with this issue. And for years now, there have been efforts to bring a bipartisan group of people together in the Congress to really solve this problem. And not just leave it be that the laws that are on the books, yes, but they're not being uh, they're not sufficient to address the challenges that we face, and we need people who really want to solve this problem in Congress to help get it done. Thank you. Question number three. It concerns the topic of abortion, and the first to answer will be Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Do you think that Congress should act to create a federal law that would either support or further restrict women's reproductive rights? Sure. No, thank you for the question. I, I just want to correct one thing. Apprehension at the border is not the same as returning, them from where, returning these illegal aliens from where they came from. They're released into the United States. Let's talk about abortion. You know, I was an obstetric anesthesiologist for 30 years at Hopkins. I've attended thousands of deliveries. I went back to my medical school textbook, and it said quite clearly that from the moment of conception, there is a human being. That's it. I hope we can all agree on that science, because as you proceed from agreeing on the science, the only question is when the rights of that human being, the baby, the fetus, whatever you want to call it, the human being, equals the rights of the mother. And that's what this debate is all about. And that, that's a debate that can be, it's a legitimate debate that should be dealt with by reasonable people not making political points about this. So when does that, when do those rights occur? I don't know, but if you look at polling, a majority of Americans agree, a large majority, that sometime after the first trimester, it's not unreasonable for a government to limit the, the access to abortion. In fact, for 47 to 50 European countries put that right about at the end of the first trimester. So I'm, I'm a co-sponsor of the Lindsey Graham bill that says, look, and I think this is what states ought to do. They ought to, they ought to set a, probably about a 15-week limit with exceptions for rape, incest, life of the mother, and physical health of the mother. Uh, and then, then let's see if we can come to a consensus. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Maryland is the free state. And we, in the first district, really care a lot about our freedoms. And what freedom is more fundamental than the right for a woman to make a choice about healthcare decisions for her own body. I can't believe that in my lifetime, women have become second-class citizens again. And unless you're changing your position right now here on stage, Congressman, your position has been the most extreme that it can be on this issue. You're not okay with what rights we still have here in Maryland. You've advocated a national ban with no exceptions for rape, incest, 
life of the mother, a total ban. You are very extreme on this issue, outside of where women in this state expect their public official to be to protect them. You talk about being a doctor, where's your Hippocratic oath to first do no harm? This decision to try to push there to be abortions with no exceptions is dangerous for women. It will cost them lives. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that Ms. Mazir has read the Lindsey Graham bill. That's the one I'm co-sponsoring. It's not an absolute ban on abortion. That's just not true. It's just not true what she says. And in Maryland, remember, the Roe decision made no difference in Maryland because Maryland has among the most liberal laws in, this, in the country where literally you can have an abortion without penalty up until the moment of birth, including for sex selection. That's the bottom line. That's the position of the Democrat bill in Congress. That's the one that stands in contradistinction to the Graham bill and cross-filed in the House, which actually sets a 15-week limit. The Democrat bill is a publicly funded abortion for any reason up until the moment of birth, including sex selection abortions. I'm sorry, that's the extreme position. Am I hearing you correctly <laughs> that you think women would carry a baby to term and decide at the end to abort it because it wasn't the gender that they want? What kind of nuts is that? You have <laughs> no idea who women are, what our experience in life is, to say that any woman would just abort a fetus late term for any reason other than her pregnancy has gone tragically wrong is an absolute offensive outrage to every woman in the state of Maryland. And if you are going to now try to hide under Lindsey Graham's bill, maybe you should also be truthful about the fact of your co-sponsorship on the Life at Conception Act, which would have a national abortion ban with no exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. You are hiding what your true extreme position is here while thankfully letting in on the secret that your position is actually more extreme than I even thought it was. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Question number four. <clears throat> the next question concerns the topic of the use of American military power, and the first to answer will be Mr. Harris. The well, what did you yeah, Sure. I'm Just, sorry. Thank you. No, I'm, used, I'm used to the order now. So <laughs> I, I haven't asked the question. Oh, I thought it was about military power. No, that was, no, no, no. There's a big, long question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, we have to add a little levity here and there. The scenarios playing out in Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Taiwan, as well as the increased tensions with Russia and China, all call into question the United States' role as a military superpower. As a member of Congress, when is the U.S. military assistance necessary, and what limitations would you apply? Now you may go. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, was, that was pretty See, <laughs> Well, by the way, what you, what you just heard is what the typical response of liberals is. They name call. She doesn't, like my, she doesn't like my answer, she calls it nuts. Fact of the matter is, the Democrat bill in Congress allowed abortion until birth, including sex selection abortions. Now, I don't think it's unreasonable to say sex selection abortions shouldn't, Harris, be unreasonable, shouldn't be allowed until birth. We, I just don't think so. We've moved on from abortion to... Well, ma'am, believe me, I know, but... You're not altering the, uh, you know, the, the rebuttal part, so uh, that's my only chance. Look, I'm a veteran of the U.S. military. I put on a uniform I wore it for 17 years. I believe in this country. I believe we are the, the beacon of liberty and freedom and democracy in the world. But this is not the Defense Department that I signed up for in 1988, believe me. It's more interested in whether or not you fund transgender surgery than whether you fund a missile system to counter the Chinese hypersonic threat. Those are the facts. I know, I sit on the Appropriations Committee. I hear the debates about this. There is more interest on the other side about whether or not we are going to use personal pro, preferred pronouns in the, in the Pentagon than to whether or not our men and women in uniform have the backing of their higher-ups and the investments in military weapon systems to protect their lives. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Ms. Mazur, your answer? 
One of the sections of the Economy First Plan that I mentioned in the beginning of this conversation is on defense and cybersecurity. I spent a lot of time meeting with generals, uh, retired generals, uh, defense contractors, and federal employees throughout the first district whose day in and day job is working in the military, in addition to uh, the military who are serving uh, in uniform today in such an amazing way to protect our country and our freedoms. <laughs> There's an entire section in that plan that talks about exactly what I think we need to do related to hypersonics and how it could be a big job creator in our district. There's a conversation in there about what needs to be done to support Aberdeen Proving Ground and uh, the important military bases that are in our district and the great research and innovation that's coming out of our military installations and labs throughout Maryland, but particularly in the first congressional district. I too am from a family that has a proud military service. My father fought in Vietnam. I will always support our veterans. And uh, I'd like to, with what time's left here, also say that we need to improve our VA healthcare system for our veterans. More and better housing opportunities and mental health services and healthcare within the VA system is absolutely necessary because promises made must be promises kept for those who've served our nation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds for rebuttal if you choose. Sure. No, look, we clearly have to take care of our veterans, and we hadn't been doing it. In fact, before uh, President Trump's, one of his greatest accomplishments, I believe, was creating the choice system in the VA healthcare system. Very important in a rural district where I had, where I had people on the lower shore tell me that they were required to go cross the bridge to go to the, to the VA hospital in Baltimore. That's ridiculous. They have a, a what, what amounts to almost a tertiary medical center right there in Salisbury, yet they could not go to that hospital. So we changed it. We put in the VA uh, health choice system. This was one of the greatest, greatest things we've done for our veterans. Is the, vet, is the VHA still, is it cured? No, it's not cured yet, let me tell you. Because you can't still fire a VA employee who's not doing a good job. You can fire the higher ups, but not the lower down employees. We have to be able to fire federal bureaucrats Federal employees who do not do their job. I don't care whether it's an IRS person not answering the phone, whether it's someone not taking care of your Medicare problems, someone take care of Social Security problems. Unionization of the federal workforce has prevented that. Thank you. Ms. Mazir. Yeah, let's talk about needing to support our veterans. Andy Harris voted against a bill to protect um, and, and offer health care to veterans who were exposed to toxic burn pits. He just very recently voted against a bill that would have provided access related to food insecurity for our veterans. And these aren't just votes against veterans at the national level, at the local level. What, what I've been doing in this campaign, what has been so striking to me, is how many people come up to me over the course of the campaign talking to me about the ways that they're seeking help from their congressman, but he just doesn't show up, doesn't listen, doesn't help them out. So I've stepped in and started doing casework and connecting people with uh, caseworkers at the <coughs> VA system for guys like Ralph and Natty Coke or Roland in Cambridge who come to me with troubles and feel like they're, they've had their back turned on them by our congressman. It's one thing to talk a big talk. It's another thing to actually show up and deliver. Thank you. We'll move on to question five. Democracy and election integrity. Despite a lack of evidence of voter fraud, nearly a third of Americans believe that President Biden was not legitimately elected in 2020. Recently, Republican-held state legislatures have passed increasingly restrictive voting laws. The result is a lack of confidence on all sides in our basic democratic structures. As members of Congress, how would you address the public's concerns? And for the record, do you think Joe Biden is our legitimately elected president, Mr. Harris? Look, Joe Biden got more counted votes than uh, Donald Trump did. That's bottom line. Uh, but in the process, Americans lost faith in the system. Now, why did they lose faith in the system? Because everybody had a TV. They watched observers in Georgia having to stand behind a glass screen 100 feet away from where ballots were being counted, and that being considered adequate observation of ballot counting. 
I've been in election boards when they count absentee ballots. You are standing over the shoulders of the person, looking at the piece of paper, everybody agreeing that that's a valid vote. Not 100 feet away behind a glass screen. Those of you who have seen 2,000 mules, let me tell you something. There were illegal ballot dropping activities going on around the country. Now, it's not the fault of the person whose ballot was being dropped. It's the fault of the people who are hiring the mules to drop the ballots. The Zuckerbucks. They took over the Green Bay election office. Oh my gosh, no wonder people don't have faith. So what do we need to do? We need to, first of all, have national voter ID. Those of you who came into this auditorium, I hope you realize you had to show an ID to come into the auditorium today. But you don't have to show an ID to do one of the most important things you ever do in your life as a citizen, which is to cast a vote. Second, strict observer laws. No observing from 100 feet away behind a glass door and no counting ballots after you send the observers home. This is what Americans saw on their TV screen. That's why they lost faith. Ms. Mazur. No, why they lost faith is because they had leaders lying to them about this election and suggesting that despite all the evidence which had shown that this was a free and fair election, because you didn't like the outcome of it, that you were gonna suggest that it was stolen. 63 court cases were thrown out between the election and the end of the year in de in December, by December of 2020, suggesting that no evidence had been sufficient enough to suggest that there was any concern, legitimate concern, about the outcome of that election. But yet, you were one of 10 members of Congress sitting in the Trump White House, December 21, 2020, having conversations about how to overthrow a democratically elected, uh, the, the, the options of that people had chosen in this government. You wanted to overthrow that election. What were you doing in there that day? I believe that if, you were stepping in to try to overthrow the results of the election because you didn't like the outcome, that you were betraying your oath of office, that you were betraying the Constitution, and you betrayed us, and it makes you unfit to serve, Congressman. It's the main reason why I jumped in this race. I was so upset about what happened that day. Yes, we need free and fair elections. And we have to make sure that, that everything is done to assure that. But once the evidence has shown it, if you just don't like the results, you don't get to step in and try to alter the course oh, of history. That is a destruction of democracy. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds for a rebuttal. Sure. Look, the faith of America was shaken in elections. You've got to do those things. You have to do things like we do in Maryland. You have to have an optically scanned ballot where it's filled out and you have a, you have a ballot that you can count manually if you have to. Now, I don't know where, where Ms. Mazir gets her news. She probably watched that CNN, MSNBC. I, I, I was there in the White House. That wasn't what was discussed, but I will tell you something. I'm the son of immigrants. I got invited to the White House, to the Oval Office. I can't tell you what it's like to sit there in front of that resolute desk in the Oval Office. I mean, a son of immigrants. I'm there thinking, the only, time I'm, the only time I ever saw a resolute desk is, you know, National Treasure, you see it on West Wing, you see it on that. And we're sitting there discussing serious topics in the Oval Office. Yeah, I went, and I would take the invitation again. Thank you. Ms. Mazzeri, you 60 seconds for rebuttal. In 12 years in Congress, the only time you were invited to the White House was to discuss, to discuss overthrowing the election results on January, for January 6th counting. I, I intend to be invited to the White House for serious conversations about economic needs for the first congressional district. I'm gonna sit in the White House and have conversations with the president about what needs to be done to expand health care and to make sure that people in our district have access to providers and good health care delivery sites. I wanna be in the White House to have conversations about what needs to be done to address the climate crisis that impacts the first congressional district so dearly. I'll never, ever, be in the White House having a conversation about overthrowing the results of an election that I disagree with. Thank you. Uh, our sixth question deals with legislative priorities. Our, the final question, it's gonna focus on legislative accomplishments of 
Representative Harris and the priorities of Heather Mazur going forward. Congressman Harris, can you highlight legislation that you have introduced during your 12 years as a congressman? Also, please highlight bills that you have sponsored during the last term that are especially important to you, and what are your legislative priorities going forward? Sure, let, let me address that. And oh, by the way, it's no, you know, Ms. Mazir thinks that Barack Obama is going to invite, invite me to the White House. I don't think so. So that's eight of those 12 years, just, just for information. Now, Ms. Mazir brought up an interesting point. She said that I only had one bill passed naming a post office. Yeah, it was actually for a black American war hero. Maybe I shouldn't have done that by her implication. But, you know, she was a highly paid federal lobbyist. Now, she doesn't say that because she wants you to think she's a farmer, but she's actually the CEO of her lobbying company, okay? She knows that a member of the Appropriations Committee, the way they get things done is in an appropriation bill, not through other bills. She should know that because she was a highly paid federal lobbyist. So in fact, I'm exceedingly effective on the Appropriations Committee. Ask any of the seafood processors in the first congressional district. Ask the people in the tourism industry who depend upon H2B workers. I head the H2B coalition, and it's my amendment, because it's not legislation, I've got to correct your show, it's not legislation uh -huh. that appropriators do, it's amendments to the appropriation bill. It's my amendment, the Harris-Pingree amendment, that provides the 60,000 extra work visas this coming year to make sure our seafood processors stay in business, our tourism industry stays in business. Business. It's my amendments to the bill that help our poultry industry stay in business, that prevent the, uh, the democratically controlled U.S. Department of Agriculture, where the Democrat controls it, from coming down on our poultry producers and potentially ruining our industries and sending it offshores. That's what I do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mazir, if you're elected, what would be your legislative priorities? The top priorities I've focused on in this campaign are the economy plan on making farmers and watermen part of the solution to the climate crisis and making health insurance more available and affordable, but making sure we have access to providers coming and serving in our more rural areas and keeping hospitals and healthcare delivery sites open for us. All of that is in great detail on my website. I want to take a minute to address some of what just came up. First of all, I, can, I, I will say that your position on the Appropriations Committee is the perfect example of how you've done nothing for us. You never put in one request for infrastructure funding for our district. And as a result, it's left to our United States Senators to bring all the resources in. You never put in for it, but you're the first in line to claim credit when the money comes in for these projects in our district. Secondly, on H-2B visas, Barbara Mikulski carried the load on that for a really long time, and it fell into disarray again when she wasn't our United States Senator. We had to put pressure on you at Hooper's Island to have conversations about what needed to be done to have continuing worker provisions so that our packing houses had pickers this season. And on top of that, you had no idea when the new visas became available that they were only available for a picking season that didn't apply to the dates when our crabbing season is in order. You have failed us on every level and every one of the things that you're sitting here bragging on. But where you have inserted yourself in the appropriations process is creating a Harris Rider on the DC appropriations bill, making it impossible for anyone in the city of the District of Columbia to implement their cannabis legalization Thank laws. Thank you, Ms. Mazir. Uh, Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds to, for rebuttal. Sure. Well, I'm not surprised that Ms. Mazir brings up the cannabis legalization because one of her employees of her lobbying business is actually a cannabis business, a marijuana business in the District of Columbia. Now, if you want the truth about who is the leader and what I've gotten done, you don't go to Ms. Mazir, you go to the, eight, to the crab picking houses in this district and you go to the people who run the tourism industry in the district and ask them who is the national champion to get those visas. I'm the one who went to bat with them. That's my number one priority, and it's been in every single appropriations bill since Barbara Mikulski left office. I've put it in every single bill. That's effectiveness. And this baloney about when, when these start and when, when they become available is not up to me. It's up to the democratically run administration. They're the ones who are screwing it up. But we're going to fix that, too, on the appropriations next time also. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Ms. Mazzieri, you have 60 seconds for rebuttal. 
So to address the climate crisis in our district, we need to incentivize farming practices that are good for the environment. By acknowledging that we stand on a giant carbon sink, we can encourage farmers to do regenerative farming practices that help sequester carbon in the soil rather than allowing it to, attract, uh, to escape up into the atmosphere. And when we work with farmers on these kinds of practices and incentivize uh, practices that are good for the environment. We bring environmentalists and farmers together for solutions that are unique to our first congressional district. Not crazy new uh, Green New Deal proposals, but proposals like our agri-climate solutions for Maryland's Eastern Shore that really put farmers in the driving seat for solving these problems again. I'm looking forward to being a congresswoman that brings those ideas forward. Really, it's necessary for us to have someone who meets with us talks with us, learns about what our challenges are, and then advocates for them in DC. Thank you. We've reached the point now for closing statements. That was our last question. Um, Mr. Harris, you have 60 seconds to provide a closing statement. Sure, thank you very much. And again, I wanna thank uh, Cecil Public Media. Thank you, Cheryl, for uh, moderating. Look, this election's pretty simple. It's about whether you think you're better off now than you were two years ago, whether you think this country's on the right track. That's it. Because if you think the country's on the right track and you're better off than two years ago, by all means, elect someone who will vote for Nancy Pelosi for speaker and who will support Joe Biden in, in all his policies. By all means, do that. But if you're the vast majority of Americans, part of the vast majority that doesn't believe we're on the right track and that thinks that the cost of living at the gas station and the grocery store, the security, your, your, your safety in your, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, if this is what concerns you, if the 70,000 fentanyl deaths conserves you from an open southern border, if you think that taking parents' rights away is the right solution, or I should say is the wrong solution, then this is an obvious choice. You vote for the person who's been fighting for these issues, for the issues you believe in for, for in the past, and I will continue to go down there and fight in the next term. Thank you. Ms. Mazur, 60 seconds. In farm country, if somebody's in trouble, you don't stop to ask them what political party they belong to. You just help them. And that's my idea of community, and it's my definition of patriotism. I also learned early on, growing up on the farm, that you back up your words with deeds. But Andy Harris is a lot of talk, but no action. He goes on about lowering prices and creating jobs, but he has no solutions for this. I do. He's going to say anything to distract from his failures. His divisiveness has kept us from getting things done. While the unity coalition we're building across this district is growing stronger every day. I regularly meet voters like Brenda, a Trump supporter I met in a parking lot, who 10 minutes into our conversation asked me for a hug and with tears in her eyes said, I've never had anyone listen to me like this. Now, I don't know if I'm going to earn Brenda's support in this election, but I will work hard for her. I will work hard for all of you and be a congresswoman for everyone. I hope I've earned your support, your trust, and your respect today. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to all the candidates for joining us today and for your dedication to public service. Thank you for being a great moderator. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs>